All right. So for those of you not familiar with Sustainable Saratoga, we're a nonprofit organization that works to encourage sustainable practices and the protection of natural resources in the Saratoga region. We're a volunteer driven organization that focuses on providing educational resources and opportunities for people to take meaningful actions as individuals and as a society to reduce our impact on the planet. Some of you might be familiar with some of our popular events like Saratoga Recycles Day and Repair Cafe or our annual Tree Toga tree planting effort, which is happening this Saturday. Others might be more familiar with some of our advocacy work to protect natural resources and to demand action to address the climate crisis. Our newest initiative is focused on creating pollinator habitat and food sources. So you may have read about pollinators being threatened uh, globally by chemical use, disease, habitat loss, and climate change. And a bunch of us at, in the community wanted to help. We wanted to do our part to help. And so we created a new pollinator committee, which has been focused the last few years on you know, getting educational resources out there. And this talk tonight is, is part of that. So it doesn't matter if you have a two acre yard or a four foot section in front of your house, all of us can create a little pollinator oasis. And Joanna's here tonight to share her journey and inspire you to get started yourself. Joanna Garrison has been an English as a new language teacher in the Saratoga School District for 30 years. She has no formal training in entomology or botany or horticulture, but is a self-taught naturalist whose curiosity about native plants and pollinators has turned her into a humble expert on the trial and error effort that is being a wildlife gardener. Her passion for learning and her share and her ability to share her knowledge with others is fantastic. I find myself learning something new from her all the time about the little insects that we take for granted or never even notice in our gardens in the first place. I also wanna point out that she's equally impressive in her photography skills. So almost all of the photos that you'll see tonight as well as the videos were taken by Joanna. So with that, I will hand it over to her. Thank you again for signing on and thank you Joanna for putting this talk together. Thank you, Wendy, very much. Um, uh, I, I am humbled and I thank everyone for joining me. Um, it's a little incredulous that, you know, so many people, when you do this, anything for the first time, that someone actually wants to hear what you have to say and um, think it's important. So for that, I am humbled, but I definitely, every time I hear the word expert, um, even in my 29 years of teaching uh, English as a new language, many of them at Saratoga, I cringe a little bit because uh, I probably know 0.001% um, of all there is to know. And uh, you're probably familiar with, with anything that inspires you, anything that you love. The more you dig in, the more uh, you learn, the more you realize you don't know and you heart. And that's how I feel every single time. You know, just today I learned things about um, uh, hawks and leaf matter and etc. cetera. So um, yes, for that, I'm always humbled. Um, but anyway, uh, let's, let's, yeah, let's get going. Um, three things I would like to convey this evening. Um, I want, uh, no matter your level of expertise, I know some of my, my, my fan base is here. Um, and <laughs> uh, thank you, Wendy, for asking me uh, to speak and some of the members of the pollinator committee that had faith in, in asking me to speak. Um, but I want everyone to learn at least something, I hope, by what you see or hear tonight. Um, the second thing is I want you to enjoy it. I want us all to enjoy it. I'm not a formal presenter. So, you know, if something goes awry or, you know, like Wendy said, if you have a question at the end and if, you know, if I can't answer it, I will definitely get back to you. Um, and um, I am hoping to, uh, you know, boost your confidence. Um, a lot of people say, oh, I, I have a brown thumb. I can't grow anything. Yes, you can, because I am no landscape designer. I have no background in any of this. And I, um, you know, we learn in, 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 in pieces, uh, piecemeal, and that's how it's been for me. So um, let's, uh, yeah, let's start. Okay, so um, this is a picture of my old house. 
<laughs> in November 2013, my husband and I raised my former home here on Bryan Street um, and built a net zero home. We we're very, very grateful um, to have uh, to be able to do that. Um, and so I was left with a blank canvas. Um, as you can see, you know, it, it was kind of a mess for a while and the place looked like a construction site even after we finished. Um, I was only able to um, keep maybe five of my original plants. And I'd always been kind of a hodgepodge gardener, which is what a friend called me one time um, when I thought I kind of knew what I was doing. And she goes, oh, you're one of those hodgepodge gardeners. You know, you get a plant, you think it's pretty, you throw it in and you really don't have much of an idea. You know, you say, oh, this, you know, takes a little more moisture. This takes, the, you know, doesn't mind dry soil. That's fine. And that's all I really thought about it because I wasn't around a lot in the summer. Um, and um, I didn't really understand the whole, the interconnectedness of, of pollinators and, and native species. And I didn't think about it. Like most of us don't, right? We see a pretty flower and we think, ooh, ah, isn't that lovely? And that's as pretty much as far as we go. Um, we might see a, a nice bee on it, but that's that's where I, um, uh, that's about as far as I went at the time. So um, I realized uh, in 2015 was when I built my first bed. And um, spoke to uh, Jesse of Jessicology. She came over to do a consult for me. And um, she saw the plants that I had and she said, oh, you know, you still have Queen of the Prairie here. And I said, oh, what do you mean? And she said, well, that's a native. And I said, Nate, what do you mean native? And she said, well, Joe, the, these plants evolved um, with, with the land and with the insects and they've been here for, for you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and she said, they, they want to be here. So they'll do well, they need less water, you don't need to maintain them. And I said, Oh, well, what, you know, what do you mean by that? So anyway, I, I dove right in. Um, I purchased a bunch of plants from her, um, from Dawn Folia of Wild Things Rescue, of um, some from Fiddlehead Creek, uh, former nursery up in um, um, near uh, Argyle. And I started reading. And um, if any of you read the 2018 article from the New York Times um, about the insect apocalypse this year, uh, that was really uh, a great cause for concern. And again, more and more I, I read and you know, you'd hear about it on the radio and in the news that we are experiencing an insect crisis on a global level. Um, and how, you know, in the article and many other articles since that, you know, when you're driving, you probably remember, you know, a lot of bugs on your windshield. And I noticed I, I used to bike all the time. I used to be eating bugs all the time. They fly in my eyes. And I've noticed in the last five to 10 years that isn't occurring as much. Um, so what, why, you know, why are we experiencing this? Well, simply put, um, we have been using way too many insecticides and pesticides, um, not only in our yards, but um, on our farms. Um, I do know that, you know, insecticides and pesticides, you know, if used nominally for a specific um, purpose, um, I know that's still done and can be, I don't mean to be, you know, use an oxymoron or be contrary here, but um, can be somewhat safely used if it's contained. Um, we have lost uh, lost so much habitat as well, uh, not only in um, urban areas, but in rural areas as well. Um, you look around you, we're constantly building. Um, and, you know, we built too. I, I, I don't mean to sound like a hypocrite. It's like, hey, you, you know, you built. But we built on our own plot. We did, uh, we were lucky enough to build um, a, a solar geothermal home. Um, and, you um, you know, that, that, that's, anyway, that's, that's a, a, a main cause for um, the insect crisis as well. And that the most irrigated crop in the U.S. is our lawn. Um, and the U.S. alone has 40 million acres of lawn. Um, and the mindset from the 50s um, was, you know, you're, we're keeping up with the Joneses. I used to do it too. I, I still, I have to say on occasion, I look over and I go, oh, wow, you know, look at how pretty and neat and trim, you know, every, every, the, the neighbor's lawn is, but I have gotten away from that mindset 
Um, and I have learned to love, you, you just kind of have to let it go and um, not try to, we're always trying to control things. And like I said in the past, I was, I was very much that way as well. So it's a real shift in perspective um, once you learn about, about this. Um, so insects, if we didn't have insects, let's say we would be swimming in sewage. Um, you know, we wouldn't, uh, we'd have a very limited uh, amount of food. Um, uh, they, you know, they rid us of, of all of our waste. They multiply our food by pollinating. They act as food for other creatures and they really form the basis of, of medicine. I, I learned this recently as well. Um, if you see this, the COVID vaccine, uh, 19 vaccine was developed in the cells of a fall armyworm moth, which I thought was fascinating. Um, and uh, my talk is also going to uh, touch on uh, some beneficial insects in the garden as well. Um, and very importantly, they nourish our soil and that sustains all of humanity all around the globe. So we really you know, again, those things, those insects we're swatting at, we're like, they're a pain in the neck. <laughs> they, they do, um, they do pretty much everything for us. We'd be lost without them. So the greatest lesson I learned when um, Jesse, and then, you know, since then, Dawn Foglia has been a fantastic mentor of mine as well. The greatest lesson I learned was what, you know, the difference between a straight species and what we call a cultivar, a native R right, a hybrid species. So again, well, you know, what, what, what's the big deal? Like, why can't I have some other plants? Well, you can, but straight species are larval host plants. So, so many millions of plants are specialized for particular insects. So 90% of insects need a specific plant to survive. And here's our iconic example. Here's the monarch caterpillar. And this uh, is, was in our garden a couple of years ago on um, common milkweed plant right outside the front door. Because, you know, common milkweed pops up all the time. Again, people are like, oh, I rip it out. It's all, it's really messy. It's like, don't rip it out. <laughs> I mean, transplant it maybe to another area, give it away, save those seeds, throw them out the window. Um, but we, we, we need milkweed. Um, so Everybody knows, you know, about the monarch, pretty much everybody. And um, it's wonderful that there's been this growing movement to save it. And populations on the West Coast this past year were up after um, um, a precipitous fall in the, in the monarch population um, nationally. So everyone's banding together for the monarch, but we need to do this for all of our invertebrates, actually. Um, so cultivars, you know, they look cute and they are pretty. And here's an example of a cultivar right here. Um, I can't, I'm a sucker for orange in the garden. I grow Mexican sunflower, which is a great beneficial annual. And I grow calendula as well, which is another annual. Um, they're not, the, the Mexican sunflower is not um, native, of course. The, but here's your cute name. It's called Major's Classic Sombrero Adobe Orange Coneflower. And I couldn't help myself. Last summer, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm going to put those with some blues and they're so pretty. So I planted them. And I saw one bee, and I do a lot of observing. I'm always in my garden, and I saw one bee, I think a honeybee, land on one, sniff it out for a second or two, and flew off. And that's the only bee that I saw on this point. So I'm probably going to get rid of them. Um, I, I, you know, again, you don't have to be um, native um, plant people are accused of being purists and being condescending, and we, I don't want to come off that way uh, at all. But um, the entomologist and author, uh, Doug Tallamy, advises we use a 70-30 ratio. And I'm also not saying you have to rip out what you have. But little by little, if you're beginning, you could plant one or two, um, or eventually, gradually, you know, get seeds from a friend, network with neighbors, um, you know, get on a, a gardening, native gardening website. I am very um, happy to uh, give seeds away as well to people. You don't um, have to do this. Our friend Christine Burgart, like her garden is spectacular and she did it mostly, um, you know, her, she got her plants for free. So uh, we do need straight species. We absolutely do because of this interconnected, this relationship that insects have to, um, that native pollinators have to these plants. So the butterfly bush comes up a lot too. Like 
hey, but you know, I hear this all the time. Like it's the, the, the uh, Latin name is the buddleia, the butterfly bush. And I know they're, they are pretty. You see lots of butterflies on them. But Doug Tallamy in his book, I got this, um, this quote from him. It's now considered an invasive shrub and it only supplies nectar to, um, is larval host to one of North America's butterfly species in Southern California. So, you know, if you have it, I'm not saying rip it out, but maybe consider some alternatives um, that are natives as well. And we're gonna talk about those. So, what, get on, oh dear. Hmm. Wendy dear, I am. Oh, there we go, sorry about that. Buttons were not um, cooperating. So this is the only wordy slide I have, forgive me. Um, I wanted to make sure that I got the facts straight. Um, and people sometimes were visual learners, sometimes were auditory learners, I'm both. So what do we mean by an invasive plant? Well, it's a non-native species. And what it does is it displaces a native plant community. So they're, it's not, um, they're not the fast growing aggressive native plants that have competing with, with one another for space, light, water, and nutrients for millions of years. So it comes into an area and sometimes it just completely takes over. And why? Because they don't have the natural enemies to keep them in check. And when you think about it, you're like, that, that makes absolute sense. So um, the second question that the counterclaim to this is, well, so what if a plant is introduced to an ecosystem changing the diversity and the quantity, like, isn't that just part of the natural process? And that's what a lot of people will argue, saying, oh, it's just, again, it's part of evolution. Aren't there more plant species in North America after a plant invasion? But of the roughly 3,300 new plant species that have been introduced to North America, um, species diversity should be higher. But, and it is, but this is what's very important as well. Ecosystems don't function on a continental scale like so many things, they function locally. I mean, you think of, right, it's important to know where we source our food as well, locally. So, um, and there are a lot of studies out there that document the elimination of plant species after an invasive plant, um, you know, moves into a, a local area. And I'm gonna bring up three of those on the next slide. So if a plant isn't pollinated, it dies and then, that plant, which has affected all of right, the, the animals that eat it, the insects, the, the animals that eat the insects, um, you know, you name it, the, 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 the plants in, in waterways as well, ponds and lakes and rivers, um, the predators are affected. So it's a food web and it is all, again, everything is interconnected. And once one species is lost, it's, you know, it, it's gone forever. Um, and there's still so many, probably millions that we haven't identified yet, you know, to this, um, at this point. Um, but we, we definitely have been losing, losing many. Um, so this is a great quote by Doug Tallamy, who is someone that I, if you haven't heard of him, I highly recommend um, reading his, his books um, and listening to him. That every time a native plant is removed from an ecosystem or even diminished in abundance, Populations of all the animals that depend exclusively on that plant are also removed or diminished, as are the natural enemies of those species. Oi, I'm sorry, these buttons are not working. There we go. Sorry, I apologize for that. So that's my last wordy slide. Um, I know no one wants to like have the presenter read her PowerPoint slides. It's boring. I apologize. Um, invasives, the bane of every ecosystem. So he, these, these pictures I took yesterday, actually. I just added this slide. Um, now, one point that my friend Karen Totino, who um, is on the board of Saratoga Plants, she's like, you have to make sure you mention <laughs> if people are removing invasive plants, never ever just toss them like 
in your bin that's going back maybe the town is picking it up dpw i know picks up ours you need to dispose of it carefully in the trash so seeds don't travel everywhere now you might be familiar with phragmites sounds like some kind of greek goddess right but boy she is evil um this was taken yesterday um out i mean i just snapped it uh from my car window as i was slowly driving by it is as you can see it is now sweeping it's everywhere and it is i don't i i forget the exact number but when i took um an invasive species uh workshop um a couple of summers ago it was on the scale of one to 100 it was in the 90s it, it is like 93 or 97 it's up there with japanese knotweed it, it is and you'll notice it now it's everywhere and it's pushing out our our native cattail and a lot of other plants um because it doesn't have again it doesn't have the natural enemies that it would in its in its native homeland to subdue it and this, um, I don't know if my neighbors are on this Zoom as well, but uh, we are constantly um, digging up bishop's weed or otherwise known as gout weed. And this I, I dug up carefully. I tried to get the root, but some of these roots can be this long. And my, my neighbor and I have contests to see who can pull out the longest root. But it, and it's great to have neighbors like that. Um, we're working together. And this also is garlic mustard. Um, I'm going to be braising this and eating it. It is edible. There are things that you can forage, but garlic mustard is another nasty invasive. And I tried to uh, get it before the flower came out in the seed head so it would spread. But I've got a lot of digging up to do on this as well. Now, question for all of you, which is not a pollinator? So we have our moths, we have our, our the Northern Broken Dash, the skipper family, we have our bumblebees, our bees, a tachnid fly, our, our wonderful beloved hummingbird, uh, beetles. This is a great little yeehaw on the mountain mint, our wedge-shaped beetle. Um, the, the wasps or bats, Can any, does anybody know um, which one is not a pollinator? Yes, it's a trick question. They're all pollinators. All of these animals um, pollinate and they all play a special role. So uh, another, you know, counterclaim, like, yeah, what's the big deal if we'd lose a few? I mean, we have millions and millions of different kinds of insects, but um, you may have read as well or heard that pollinators are responsible for um, over 85% of the world's flowering plants and more than two thirds of our world's crop species. Um, the US alone grows more than 100 crops that either need or benefit from pollinators. And that, of course, um, impacts our economy as well. I mean, up to $3 billion per year is, is tremendous. But beyond agriculture, pollinators are what's called keystone species. And a keystone species can be a plant, animal, bacteria, or fungi. And they're the glue that holds a habitat together. Um, and then, of course, the fruits and seeds that come from this insect pollination are a major diet for birds, right? Again, there's that food web. It impacts everybody. So, um, uh, you know, one mama bird needs thousands of caterpillars just to raise her brood every year. I mean, where's that going to come from if we, um, you know, if we're not supplying the plants um, that will... Uh, uh, grow the populations of our of our caterpillars. So now we're leading into um, some native species themselves, some larval hosts, which are are so important. Um, this the the viola sororia, or these little these sweet little violets. Sometimes they're dappled. Um, these are the common purple. They're well, blue. They look purple, but we call them the common blue violet. So you may not have known. I remember learning this, and I I was just blown away that this amazing great spangled fritillary, who is nectaring here on the Joe Pie wheat, which we will be selling at our our plant sale. Um, you know, lays its eggs, not on the leaves, but just around the leaves. So you have to be careful. You know, people tug these out of their lawns and, 
oh, they're just another weed. And I think, again, there, there is a growing awareness um, because they are sweet, um, but they, yeah, the fact that they're a larval host to the fritillary is just, is just wonderful. Now, um, I re this another lesson that I learned um, just a few years ago, actually, um, I am growing pretty much all our vegetables and tomatoes and a lot of our flowers from seed this year. It's just a third year I've been growing from seed, um, you know, always ever learning. But bumblebees are responsible, sweat bees are as well, but bumblebees are uh, predominantly responsible for pollinating tomatoes. You know, a lot of things they pollinate, but honeybees cannot pollinate tomatoes. And, you know, we think of the honeybee, that ubiquitous bee, you, uh, it's a European, it's, you know, originally from Europe. So, you know, it's been, you know, honeybees are used in, in agriculture and they're very important as well. But sometimes honeybees can kind of outcompete other native bees. Um, there have been studies that I have read for um, nectar supplies. Um, so, you know, again, we need, we really need to, to um, maintain enough plants for our native pollinators. So buzz pollination is, the really super cool. Um, another word for it is called sonication. So I'm going to play a video right now and um, have you hear our, our sweet little bumble. So what she's doing, <laughs> she is using her thorax, right? She's, well, the ultimate in twerk, right? She shake, oh, excuse the airplane flying above too. She is shaking the pollen off of the flower onto her body and honeybees do not buzz pollinate. They can't do this. So I love, I love that. Um, and there is the, the bumble on the tomato plant, which is wonderful. So flowers and um, Vegetables really go, natives and vegetables, if you do grow both or if you are, are aspiring to grow both, they grow, they, they just go hand in hand. They're wonderful. Um, this is the bumble on the um, turtle head or Shalom Glabra. And I apologize. Wendy told me, you know, the audio isn't very good in this one. So I will chat above it. You probably can't hear it, but. Um, this is also host plant to the Bar Baltimore checker spot butterfly. This lovely plant um, that blooms um, August to September. And this cutie as well is uh, <laughs> trying, to get her, try, trying to get her head in there. Oh dear. Oh boy, sorry about that again. There we go, next slide. All right, so now we're on to the moths, um, or as we say, accidental pollinators. What do I mean by that? That means when they, moths and um, um, some, you know, butterflies and wasps as well, um, and other invertebrates, when they um, fly to a flower in search of nectar for nourishment, they um, pick up some pollen grains on them and they inadvertently or accidentally spread them to other flowers, thus pollinating them. So here, these are um, diurnal moths, because obviously you can tell this is during the day, um, on the asters, aromatic aster. And we are selling both of these plants as well at the native plant sale. And this awesome creature, um, I remember the first time I saw a hummingbird moth, or we say clear wing sphinx moths, um, yeah, I, you know, you don't know what it is. You're like, what is that weird looking thing? <laughs> but it is, they're, they're, they're just fantastic. And uh, we see them every year now. Um, we see the uh, different, the Diffinus and the Thisbe actually in the one with the, the black and white stripes as well, which is great. It looks like a bumble. Um, and here's a yellow collared scape moth um, on the asters. So, What's going on here? Um, this is the button bush shrub, which is a great native and very attractive to the, 
the sphinx or the hummingbird moths that you you saw and also has a great value for native bees and, and bumblebees i call it the dr seuss plant it kind of looks like the covid molecule i i apologize i don't have a picture of the flower here but it's really funky um it's it's a shrub like a little tree it can be grow to be maybe six eight ten feet tall depending on how happy it is but if you look at this leaf right i you know you see things peripherally i'm constantly you know, seeing, noticing things. And I ran up to it and I was like, oh, I had just missed the female um, leaf cutter bee. What she does is she cuts out, right? She chews little holes in the plant. So, you know, sometimes often when you, when you see plants, like, you know, the caterpillars have to eat the plant, we kind of freak out. We're like, something's eating my plant. Oh, that's awful. Well, it's actually not because if your plants are not getting eaten, then they're not really serving a purpose. Um, and, you know, and we're going to, we're going to bring up another creature that gets vilified in the garden later as well. That eats a lot of plants. Um, but you know this this great so look at her would you look at that little pollen butt there isn't that the cutest little thing you've ever seen so this is one species of leaf cutter bee and um i i had never seen these bees in my garden before until i i had a lot of natives and they are um very very important pollinators i just love them so here we go this uh <laughs> wasps. Um, wasps are great. They perform two uh, amazing functions. They are incredible controllers of what, what we deem as pests in the garden. And they are also pollinators. They're also wonderful inadvertent pollinators as well, accidental pollinators. Um, and most of us have, uh, uh, well, we associate wasps and we go, oh, a wasp, a, a good friend of mine said, I hate wasps. I kill them all the time. And I'm slowly, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working on it with her um, because we, we've either been stung by one um, or we've had, they've flown at us and we've heard these crazy stories of, oh, I hit a wasp nest and oh my God, it was awful. They chased and they wound up in the hospital. It was terrible. But if, if you see it, most of the species in North America, over 90% are solitary. That means that they find themselves a little nesting cavity, a little burrow and the, in the ground. And that leads me to another point that if we all have perfectly manicured lawns, you know, if you don't have little spots of ground or dirt, sand, what, whatever it might be, they can't find homes for themselves. So you're not going to have these fantastic pest controllers. These are, these are the natural pest controllers in our garden. You know, we don't need to spray chemicals because if you plant a lot of natives, you know, you have, again, you have that interconnectedness, everything feeds off each other. The, they will show up. And um, I, you know, I hate to claim favorites, but um, the, the potter wasp I see quite a bit uh, on the mountain mint and um, the mud daubers are great. These thread wasted. I mean, look at this this really cool thin waist here. I I you know have many different species of these. This gal, she is lo they're lovely. I mean, they have never ever bothered me, and I say that sincerely. And this sweetie, you you will see if you look these wasps up yourself, it will say gentle wasp. And I know it does sound oxymoronic, but it really is true. They're a little more skittish than bees. You know, you come around the bumbles and they're like around you, but the wasps are, they, again, they're a little more skittish. They, they, they have a different trajectory. They might be a little more spooked by you, but I've come up, you know, this close, even to the, the paper wasp and the uh, yellow jackets are the two uh, families of, of social wasps that have nests, large nests, and they need to protect their nests and so they can get nasty. But these solitary sweeties are really not a, they have never been a threat. They never have. You can come over to my garden and I will show you, um, especially on the mountain mint. My God, it's, we call that the pollinator disco. They just love it. So um, there is only one bee on this slide. So if anyone wants to unmute, I would love it or, or share in the chat. And Wendy, if you wouldn't mind um, checking the chat out, 
Um, where is the one B in this on this slide? Does anybody want to answer? Can anybody find it? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> one guess for on the flocks. No, but that's a good guess. So that the, I, you know, another incredible thing uh, are the the um, flies. Just they are incredible pollinators as well. I bought this book a few months ago called Superfly. Highly recommend it, and that will be on my resource page at the end because um, I know I'm dropping a lot of names. And I did. Uh, there is going to be a resource page at the end that you can shoot. You know, you can take a photo of if, if you care to. But um, the one bee down here is our little, our bumble. That's the only bee. So this, these two right here, if you can, Wendy, can you see the mouse that I'm yeah. circling? Okay. So this is a bald-faced hornet fly. And what do you think it's mimicking? The bald-faced hornet, which um, I had a, well, there was a, a photo of that in the last picture. So look at this the the difference between flies and bees one pair of wings bees have two pair flies have one pair and look at the big bulbous eyes this here this is a drone fly they're fantastic pollinators this is a type on the aster this is a type of drone fly um this i have this fantastic well i i think it's a hilarious video i call it <laughs> this flies like bongo wing on you know <laughs> <laughs> pollinating and getting some nectar off the off the, the flocks. This up until a little while ago, I thought it was a wasp. It is a fly. And this gorgeous thing is, I mean, doesn't this look like a Grecian urn, right? It reminds me of art history. The, this is um, a syrphid or hover or flower fly. And the syrphidae, the syrphid flies are a large family of um, incredible pollinators as well. This is a um, shiny bog fly. Look at that beauty. This is another syrphid fly here getting um, predated, eaten by an orb weaver. I was wondering when I took the picture why the fly didn't fly away. <laughs> and the later went, oh, because it's getting eaten. <laughs> and this is a really cool fly too. Um, and, and this as well is a fly. Again, you see those bulbous eyes. This kind of looks a bit more like a fly though. And this is a hornet fly as well. And it is mimicking, it's called Batesian mimicry. And it's when a harmless creature mimics a dangerous creature in order of course, to protect, protect itself from predators. And I, I just, they're amazing. Flies actually, um, there are studies that flies can pollinate at cooler temperatures in, in areas of, of altitude um, or, you know, just in cooler areas where bees can't. Bees stop pollinating at a certain temperature. Flies can pollinate when it gets down to the 40s and 50s and bees can't do that. And does anybody here like chocolate? I bet there's a resounding silent yes, right? Thumbs up, yeah, right? Flies pollinate chocolate. <laughs> Another fact that blew me away. So if it weren't for flies, they're teeny, teeny, tiny flies called midges. And they can get into the, um, the chocolate flower that other insects can't, that bees can't. So next time you have a chocolate bar, thank a fly. All right, now moving on with the flies. And um, this is a, a fact, another lesson I learned. Um, th uh, this is a photo from my friend Hunter Mays, um, a buddy, a teacher buddy of mine. Now he grows, like he has a beautiful garden. It's absolutely beautiful. His place, he his, his and his mom's place, it looks like a, like a park. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, he is of a more traditional, tidier nature. He calls my plants weird, but he's getting to like them. And that's a good thing. And he's not using um, uh, as many, like he's not using, um, you know, chemicals like he used to. So that's a good thing too. But um, if you were an insect and you, you needed, you know, a little snack here, which flower would, would be easiest for you to access? Now, again, we're not, don't give up your rose. I mean, roses are incredible, right? And I have some, I have lilacs, I have peonies. I'm not giving those up. They're beautiful. The anemones, the ranunculus, you know, the non-natives are beautiful. But 
you can't, bees can't get in here, right? And also the amount of, of like nutrition level is not as concentrated as it is in many natives as well. So these cirphid flies, these really cool like little Greek urchin flies, they are just a buzz. I mean, bees love them as well, but this is a native uh, a Virginia rose um, that, that's a shrub and it grows by suckers. So it grows really fast. Um, and there's a, a lovely climbing, a Rosa setagura. I have a climbing rose um, that's beautiful as well. And it's just a lot easier for them to, to get at and therefore pollination um, takes place. All right, love this. So here's our, our, our ambush bugs. The first time I saw this guy was on the, uh, the giant yellow hyssop. Again, not a super showy plant. People probably think it's like a big weed, but it's a very important specialist plant. And I thought, okay, tiny dragon, who the heck are you? Who are you? Look at how prehistoric this guy looks, right? And uh, they're always playing freeze because they're laying in wait, right? For a meal. So this video I captured on the mountain mint and that is a, a, another species of jagged ambush bug. Poor little bumble got snatched. So nature is not kind. Nature um, knows best and they, everyone has to eat. But those little flies here, while the jagged <laughs> ambush bug is sucking juices, uh, has paralyzed the bumble and is sucking juices from it. These are called freeloader fl flies. Say that eight times fast, freeloader flies. And they are kleptoparasitic. So they are actually stealing part of the meal that the, the jagged ambush bug, and they're taking advantage of a free snack. And I mean, why wouldn't you? But you'll see these often in the garden. I just love these guys. Um, and now we come to my dear hummingbird. <laughs> Um, so they will be coming soon. I have to say, oh, geez, I know my husband makes fun of me because I do the countdown um, when the hummingbirds come. Typically in Saratoga County, you know, they say usually like Mother's Day to Labor Day is when we have the ruby-throated hummingbirds. Now, Jack here um, is on the um, echinacea, and this was a couple days before he died in our garden. Um, and it was very, very sad that he died. I hope he died from natural causes. Um, I hope he didn't eat some um, sugar water that had gone bad. Um, I do place, um, you know, I, I make, it's four parts water, one part sugar. You, you know, you have to make sure you clean it really well, scrub it if you do put out. We love to have our hummingbirds. And I, um, you know, now that I have more hummingbird friendly plants, I, I vacillate like, Hmm. You know, I have friends that don't put them out at all anymore. And then I have friends who do, but um, every year I find someone who said, Oh, I, you know, I'm going to change mine in a couple of weeks. I'm going to change. And I'm like, no, you know, and don't use brown sugar. Don't use any kind of sugar except white, you know, white table sugar. Um, if you are going to put out sugar water and it has to be cleaned, the feeder has to be cleaned two to three, every, you know, two to three days, um, especially in the heat because if that bacteria grows and if they ingest any of that bacteria, their tongue can swell and they will not be able to eat and they need to eat every 10 to 15 minutes and they will die. So I'm just hoping they live typically three to five years only. And um, I, you know, Jack chose to, you know, die in our garden and I have to be content with that. And I buried him beneath this beautiful, Oh, the coral honeysuckle. Again, this is a native, Lanicera sempervirens. Be careful. Don't get the Japonica. Don't get the Japanese version um, because they share the same coral and trumpet honeysuckle. And I used to be confused too. And then I realized, oh no, we want this one. Isn't that absolutely stunning? It's one of the only like tropical looking plants I think that I have in my garden. I know there are a lot of others. I just don't have them. But that is also a host uh, a host plant to the, um, the azure butterfly and one of the clear wing moths as well. And as you can see, you know, this is called the, the natural adaptations. Um, our hummingbird has these long beaks. So any tubular kind of flower they're going to love. 
and the Cardinal Lobelia, I don't have a picture of that, but that is another big favorite that blooms. This one blooms in June to July and, you know, Peter's off, but there's still some blooms into the fall. Ours is now like after five years, ours is like 15 feet high and grows into the deck, creates a little barrier as well, which is wonderful. But the Cardinal Lobelia is another big favorite. Um, and this is Zizia Aurea or the Golden Alexander we're selling as well at our, at our plant sale. And this is Sheldon. <laughs> I named him Sheldon. Um, our, well, maybe my husband named him Sheldon, but anyway, this was Sheldon, our black swallowtail caterpillar. And um, would you look and see what he grew into? Beautiful, huh? Or she, actually, I'm not really, I can tell the monarch male and female apart, but I, I can't remember if this is a male or female. Someone can, someone can actually tell me that if they'd like to. Uh, this, okay, here we go. Another extremely cool, <laughs> Every, everything's a story in the garden, right? So I'm coming out one day and I'm passing the Coreopsis, which uh, the Lance Leaf Coreopsis we're also selling at our, at our plant sale. So I'm coming out and I, I'm like, wait a second, it's not windy. Did that petal just move? And I notice that, uh, yeah, there's no, it's not a petal after all. Wait, what, what, what is that? It, oh my God, that is actually <laughs> a caterpillar, the camouflage looper that dresses itself, right? It camouflages itself to match the flower that it's on. So I've seen it on different flowers, but every summer I find it on the Coreopsis. And is that not like the coolest thing ever? I mean, this is a Color. I just love it. I, I, oh, I just think they're, they're fantastic. All right. So now beneficial insects. Again, everything is related. Everything's interconnected. We have our native plants. We get more of our native pollinators. We have our fantastic beneficial insects. They all start coming as well. So my beautiful honeysuckle, which I just mentioned, that grows up our deck, Absolutely, I call it like one of our little masterpieces. I just love it. And of course, I love it for the hummingbirds. And I know that, you know, some people we use neem oil, which is a, a more uh, natural deterrent. Um, and aphids are a bummer. And the aphids have been, were pretty rampant last year. And they, they started coming the year before. And I thought, well, maybe I should just cut it down. But I thought, no, the honey, you know, the hummingbirds love it. And, and, um, I need to leave it up. And then I swear it, it, it never fails. As soon as I start kvetching about something in the garden, like, oh man, the aphids, what am I going to do? The next day I see these little buggers everywhere. I see them on the deck. I see them on the chairs, on the plants, you know, they're, they're I'm like, so does anybody know what this is? Because if you have an aphid problem, you want these around. Well, once that, that was an aphid larva. So ladybugs, which, right, munch up to, even the larva themselves eat hundreds in that, that span of like two weeks that they're a larva. The ladybug can munch up to 5,000 aphids in its lifetime. You want ladybugs. Now, some people buy them and have them brought in. Um, I'm... I just, I don't do that. I'm not a proponent of that. I've heard there, you know, have been issues with, with having them, raising them. Um, I sort of just let nature take its course. Um, and from what I have read and heard recently, there has never been a study, maybe, maybe, you know, you can prove me wrong, but what I have read and heard, there has never been a study of aphids killing a plant. They come, they munch. Aphids are food for so many different insects. Um, wasps, bees, you know, hummingbirds eat aphids and the ladybugs, as you can see, this ladybug brigade, they come in and they munch and it's fantastic. And I just, I saw the larvae, I'm like, wow, <laughs> the answer to my dream. Did I still have aphids? Yes. But did it kill my beautiful plant? It did not. 
So this is a fantastic beneficial. Now, if you're new, kind of new to gardening and you're worried, you, you know, you're not sure where to start and you're nervous, try some echinacea. Butterflies and bees absolutely love it. It's a host plant as well for the silvery checker spot butterfly. Um, this is part of our garden right here where it grows. Oh my God, like I've got all sorts of things that if you've ever heard the term volunteer, when a plant lands somewhere, the seed's been dropped either by wind or, you know, a squirrel, a chipmunk, a, a whatever, a bird. Um, when they just pop up somewhere, like, like the, um, the oxide sunflower, I didn't grow there. I didn't grow the ironweed there, but it came and that's okay because I'll just move them or maybe I'll just keep them there, right? So echinacea um, here is an Eastern tiger swallowtail. Um, again, once you start, you know, uh, growing native plants, you'll see these all over the place. They're beautiful. And I love, look at the pollen pants on this baby, right? Look at all that pollen. That's serious. So um, this is uh, the, uh, the great blue lobelia. We are selling these two plants as well. We're selling a couple different kinds of mountain men, I think. Easy, so easy. Anything in the mint family, you might hear, oh my God, mint takes off. Well, if you pot your mint, your peppermint, spearmint, chocolate mint, whatnot, you know, you pot it and you bury it or you keep it contained, you know, I sure, because it will take over. But this is where we can fight plants with plants because I had a bishop's weed problem. Of course I did. Um, and this is on one side over by the, the, uh, of, of the fence. And this is a lilac tree, probably 34 year old lilac tree that I'm not getting rid of because the former owners had it. And it's just a big, lovely old tree. It makes me think of Thelma. Um, but I thought, you know what? Let's try fighting plants with plants. And Nancy Lawson of um, the Humane Gardener, again, will be on my resource list, who's become a friend of mine now. Um, she has a wonderful blog. And she wrote an article about fighting plants with plants. And I thought, yeah, I'm gonna put a mint family in there deer as well if you live in a, um, a more rural area we do see deer once in a while in our neighborhood but they usually don't jump the fence uh deer don't don't eat um mint families typically and don't like um mountain mint um and mint can also uh, my next door neighbor did a great thing he deterred um i think it was was it yellow jackets or hornets but anyway it was a social wasp and he uh folded up a brown paper bag stuck if I believe so, he had mint as well, and just put it all around the area, and the wasps went to a different area. We never needed to use chemicals, which was great. Um, but these plants go grow really well together, and they are also host plants as well. And the the, the mountain mints, um, I call the well, a lot of us in in you know the garden world call it the pollinator disco because by August it is covered with the beetles, the ambush bugs, wasps, bees, bee flies, you name it. Um, it it's just a huge winner. I, I learned of this plant from the Catskill Native Nursery in Kerhonkson, another, another wonderful nursery. And um, it's fantastic. So later in, in the season, um, you know, the monarchs, of course, must have milkweed. It's their exclusive specialized plant to lay their eggs on and then the caterpillars consume the milkweed and then um, those monarchs that arrive here um, typically in July will die um, but these monarchs um, the ones that I don't know you know once you start again learning about this the lines are a little thicker on their bodies it's almost like you know they're bulking up um, and in late summer, we, we, you have to think about seasonally uh, growing at all, having, having plants in season like a buffet as Heather Holm, um, uh, who wrote a couple of great books, uh, one about wasps has called having, leaving a buffet. So we need something in the spring, early summer, summer, late fall. And monarchs um, absolutely love, and so do all bees, but the, the uh, Li Liatris uh, aspera, um the rough blazing star we are selling the spicata i believe the laetra spicata but either one um they're fantastic and we are also selling four kinds of goldenrod 
Now, goldenrod, again, I see, I grew up and I was like, oh, it's that plant that makes you sneeze, pull it out. I hate goldenrod. Well, no, it's not the goldenrod. It's the more diminutive ragweed that grows next to the, near the goldenrod. So all of my friends that had allergies were cursing the goldenrod. It's, it's really, it's the ragweed. And yes, pollen floating around the air makes the sneeze. A lot of us have, you know, allergies right now that we're suffering from. Um, but golden rods are essential. Um, I don't have a picture of bone set on here. Bone set is another uh, fantastic monarch uh, nectaring plant. Um, a lot of you know butterflies and bees love bone set. But yeah, golden rod. It, look at look at how lovely it is. So it's a host plant as well. Um, and these asters are fantastic. The aster family you can't go wrong. Aster family, I think is the largest group of flowers in the world after lilies. There are just thousands of, of in this family. Um, and sometimes they flop, you know, you can put them up. I don't, mine just flop over, but absolutely covered with um, bees and butterflies it, and, and flies, bee flies, it's fantastic. So again, another beneficial insect. What, you know, I'm outside and I'm, Oh, I've got like my glass of wine or my beer. I'm sitting in my, my scarlet red <laughs> Adirondack chair in the garden and evening is calm. And I'm, I'm like waiting for the fireflies to come out. And then right as it gets dusk, dusk time, you start seeing where you see them during the day, but you start seeing the damselflies and the dragonflies cleaning about like, whew, it's fantastic. Um, it's great. Like all these hovercrafts, they're just, you know, it's, it's, it's great. It's one of my favorite times. I love the morning and I love the evening. And um, these uh, critters are fantastic. This is a shadow darner dragonfly I found on the sidewalk and brought home because I think it was dying and I wanted it to die in the garden, but it was, it was huge. It was like three inches long. And then this is a damselfly and the, um, an, a little fact, fun fact, the damselflies, you can tell it's a damselfly because the wings are flat and the dragonflies, the wings are up like this. So how many mosquitoes does one dragonfly or damselfly eat in a single day? 30 to hundreds of them. Now, yes, there could be thousands of mosquitoes on your property, but the more dragonflies and damselflies you have, the better. And this um, uh, grasses, I, uh, this is my only photo of switchgrass, Panicum virgatum. And grasses are highly beneficial um, to wasps and pollinators as well. So what is the second most vilified critter in the garden after the wasp, after the hornet, right? Or the yellow jacket? The bunny, right? Um, cute things, but you know, we don't want them. We want them in your garden. We don't want them in our garden, right? Um, and let me tell you, I wasn't always super fond and, and um, feeling friendly because true bunnies would come in and hoover all my plants. And um, in the back, when we were building, I never put grass seed down. I put a little eco lawn seed down in the front. But again, not knowing what I was gonna be doing and knowing I wanted, you know, learning more that I wanted flowers and beds, um, and I wanted like, instead of mulch, I wanted what they call green mulch. I wanted to just have like native plants spreading on the ground um, as ground cover. We just let it grow. And yeah, you know what? We've got crabgrass, we got a lot of plantain, which people think's ugly, even though it's used medicinally. My, my friend whose parents are Chinese said, oh yeah, my mom used to dig that up and use that for a poultice and yada, yada, yada. Um, there are lots of things that we can forage in our own, uh, yards or meadows. Um, there's a lot of clover here, but um, what do bunnies love to eat? You will see. This is Nancy Bunny. I filmed this when Nancy Lawson was visiting, so I called her Nancy. So it's very sweet when, when Nancy was inside and um, when I filmed this and I had, was quite close 
And um, Nancy uses this sometimes in her presentations at the end for all the bunny haters. And she said that she always has, people always crack up in the audience because it, it does remind me of Lady and the Tramp, right, with the spaghetti noodle. But um, yeah, uh, I, you know, my husband and I have probably four, we do have fence around, right? Again, don't want to sound hypocritical. Um, do I want, you know, 30 or 50 of them in the garden? Well, you know, we, we do have, have fence around our vegetables. But I have to say, other than eating, sometimes like they eat some beet leaves, um, they nibble down, you know, they like tender baby leaves. Once your plants are established, I have not had rabbits disturb um, my, my mature plants. I haven't. And uh, Nancy calls them nature's pruners, which I think is very sweet because Nancy is the quintessential humane gardener. Um, someone you need to follow if you're on social media um, and read her book, The Humane Gardener. And uh, yeah, I just now, you know, like what did I plant in the fall? Um, a, um, a service berry tree I got from Dawn Foglia. Planted it in the fall. All right, forgot to cover it up. I came out in March or April. I went, oh yeah, it got eaten. It's this big now. But I thought, well, I noticed the other day before I started cursing anything, <laughs> I noticed that it is growing. There are teeny, teeny little buds on it. So maybe if it doesn't get, you know, too large, I will cover it up in the fall. So you can always do that as well. Oops, there we go. So leaf cover. What, you know, you may have heard the whole leave the leaves thing. And oh my God, we like to rake all our leaves and bring them to the curb. And I used to do that as well. But let's, here, here are a couple of examples of why it is important. There are myriad examples, but here, here are a couple of them. This was last summer, around 2.30 in the afternoon. It was hot, it was in the 80s, it was humid. And I was back in the alley. And I noticed that, you know, it was kind of time for a nap, wasn't it? So I got down close to her to film this. It's a little blurry. And there she was taking a nap. She didn't move. I went back and checked on her 20, 30 minutes later and she had gone. You know, we, everything has to, everyone has to sleep. But if it weren't for that leaf, you know, and if it weren't for other leaf covers, she, I don't know where she would have found protection. Again, if you, if you just have, you know, if you don't have any protection anywhere, insects can't find that protection and they can't lay eggs, you know, they can't reproduce. Um, Birds can't, you know, just today I learned that hawks uh, find 80% of their sustenance under in leaf matter. Like, you, you, you know, if you've seen critters in the woods, you know, they're always fluffing up and, and, and um, agitating leaves and they're, they're looking underground because that's where insects, that's where they reproduce, that's where they live, that's where their populations are. And this one, this is a queen bumble from last, early last year in the bee bomb in another bed. See all my um, dried maple seed leaves from the neighbor's tree, whatever, I've got leaf matter. But you notice how the plants are growing anyway. And I've got twigs and stuff. Well, she is, she needs to find, right, her, a, a nesting cavity because she is gonna be um, producing her brood very soon. And so she needs to find that. They need protection there. And there she goes. I followed her as far as I could. And there she is beneath the leaves. Fine. I found her little burrow. And I made sure I stayed away from her after that. So leaves are important for so many. Now, um, some, <laughs> if you look at the photo on the left, I hope you can see this. Um, we have our little pollinator habitat sign here, and uh, one from... Um, Xerxes. I have one in the back and one in the front. Now, you know, it might look like, again, we're, we're used to that mindset where you, we're so used to like sweeping up and everything being pristine and clean. And we, we, we feel like, oh God, the neighbors are going to look down on us and we're going to look sloppy. And I don't know, it might look like we're not home and maybe someone will try to like break in. <laughs> like, but all these leaves I left here from the fall because I thought, well, let's see, firefly larvae um, are under, you know, underground. They're actually alive as larvae for up to 
two years before they become the actual firefly that we see that we that we enjoy so much. And I thought, well, you know, let's let's see, like, it, are the plants going to grow through them? And look at these photos here. Yes, <laughs> they do. I wish you could come over now. I invite you to come over 48 Bryan Street between East Ave and Second. You can come up and you can see in this in this photo here, the second photo, the golden ragwort pushing up through the leaves, the Jacob's ladder, the foam flower, the columbine, um, the um, the Solomon seal. These the, the plants push up through them. The trillium they do come. This is woodland phlox. This is uh, meadow rue, and this is chocolate bugbane. They push through. So it might look like ooh, but you'll get used to it. So we are not lazy. We are just intentional gardeners. That's what I like to say. Oh, and this is Pennsylvania sedge, another grass. The sedges are, I wanna actually plant more sedges. They're fantastic. The, these are drought tolerant. Because of the Norway maple in the front, which you can't see here, the invasive Norway maple, which the, the town loves to plant because they grow fast and they're cheap. But um, it would be lovely to have a different, um, God, I, I'd love to have an oak tree or a hemlock or something else. Um, but they, those, those Norway maple roots are sucking a lot of the moisture out of this. Dawn, let me know that later. So anything that's living here, um, I don't even water it. And I would be very remiss if I didn't mention the issue of climate change. So natives take less water, less maintenance. And like I said, I... I mean, yes, okay, you might say, well, Joe, it rained 25 days out of 30 last July. That is true. <laughs> it did. But I kind of forget about the yard, you know, the gardens up front because I'm so busy in the back and with the vegetables and everything. Um, I don't really um, think about it. But with the pollinator habitat, what, the, what this sign is saying, and last weekend, I even had two people go by in the alley. It was really cute. This, this woman and her husband were walking by, beautiful day on Sunday, right? And they saw the pollinator habitat sign in the back. And she said, oh, we live in Bowles and Spa. And I love coming by and seeing your garden in the summer. And I took a picture because you can, you can um, take a picture of, of the little, um, oh, what do you call it? The little wahoji, anyway. <laughs> And you can pull up their website and the Xerxes Society is a fantastic resource. Um, and I highly recommend you uh, checking out um, their, their fantastic articles as well. So Fireflies, um, great book, another <laughs> Silent Sparks by Sarah Lewis, um, wow. So she's a biologist, lives in Massachusetts. I follow her on Instagram as well. I didn't realize there was a firefly that was out during the day. I saw, I noticed this a couple of years ago and I thought, oh, that's a cool beetle. And um, took this picture on an Asclepius purpurescens, a purple milkweed, which I hope will come up. I bought from Dawn last summer and I hope will come up. Probably will, it's a milkweed. Um, a little finicky though than the pink, I guess. But uh, yeah, this is the dark firefly and they use airborne scents to find and attract mates. They don't light. They don't have the bioluminescence. So where did I see one last spring? You know, I'm bumbling around my neighbors. I'll probably always think I'm a whack job because I'm, you know, I'm always like on the ground and taking pictures and observing. And I saw, I have a video of one, but I saw one of these fireflies finding, you know, going under the leaf litter for protection. And um, some ants, you know, were curious about it and crawling on it and then leaving it alone. But there, there was the firefly and I thought, wow. And I, I looked in her book and I said, yeah, it's very common and it's called the dark firefly and they're out during the day. Um, so yeah, these, these you know, incredible um, creatures of, of, you know, the iconic uh, critter of nostalgia for us, right? Um, there's nothing like, an evening of fireflies, but um, their populations um, have greatly decreased as well because we're not fostering habitat for them. Um, and most insects actually live underground longer than they do. Um, some butterflies like the Promethea and some butter, they don't even, once they hatch, you know, they don't even eat and they don't have a long time to live. So, um, it is all about 
perspective. And this is a photo of our alley in the back, Pepper's Alley. And some people might think, wow, that's kind of unruly and messy. And I, you know, I, I have changed over the years. Um, I didn't do a bloody thing to this last summer because our family had um, some health issues and um, I didn't get to it. And it is, uh, you know, I just let it grow. And the milkweed propagated and the oxeye sunflower. And this is scutellaria. Um, this is skullcap, which is great. It's actually an herb used in headache remedies. Um, and, uh, the, the pokeweed is fantastic. This was a volunteer. So, you know, this, this quote right here, the difference between a flower and a weed is a judgment I got on a tea bag. But um, this is another uh, great quote. Contentment is destroyed by comparison. We're always looking at, and I do it as well. And we, you know, we look on social media, which is, is probably the worst. And we're always saying, oh, but I didn't do this. I did. I have made so many mistakes in my garden. Things have died. Um, things, I'm not a designer, you know, things have propped up where I haven't wanted them. I'm always pulling weeds, but you know what? I mean, at the end of the day, I always say the insects don't care <laughs> and the birds don't care. It's for them. I'm a wildlife gardener now. I'm not really, I mean, do I garden for myself? Yeah, absolutely. But it's, it's a different kind of beauty now, and it's a different kind of satisfaction. So it is truly our human sub subjective view to um, what we, you know, what we place importance on. And I say, you know, just go and just, just do it. Just start somewhere. So um, this last, I'm, I am ending. I see the time. I'm sorry, Wendy. Have I gone over? It is 743. Um, I hope I haven't been boring anybody. But um, it's weird just like, seeing your face, Wendy, because I'm not seeing everybody else's. And I like, I feel like I'm giving this to myself. But um, this is a quote from um, a wonderful um, author, Benjamin Vogt. He actually has his PhD in writing. He wrote um, in literature and he used to write poetry. And now he's a fantastic steward for natives living. Uh, he's in Nebraska, I believe. And he lives this quote comes from his perspective because he lives in a community where everyone has perfect lawns and perfect houses and they all, a lot of them pretty much look the same. And, you know, if that's where you live, fine. You know, if that, that again, no, no judgment, but um, his looks vastly different because he is planting natives and trying to spread the word. So he says, your garden is a protest. It is a place of defiant compassion. It's a space to help sustain wildlife and ecosystem function while providing an aesthetic response that moves you. For you, beauty isn't just pedal deep, but goes down into the soil, farther down into the aquifer and back up into the air and for miles around on the backs and legs of insects. You don't have to see microbes in action, birds eating seeds, butterflies laying eggs, ants farming aphids. Just knowing it's possible in your garden thrills you. It's like faith and it frees you to live life more authentically. Your garden is a protest for all the ways in which we deny our life by denying other lives. Plant some natives, be defiantly compassionate. So you saw the before picture of the demolition. This was taken July, 2020. We've even made more changes. I'm always putting in new things, moving stuff around. Um, I started in July of 2015. So five years later, it went from a really yucky construction site with crappy, rocky soil that we had to pay. We had, the city made us fill in the hole from construction. <clears throat> and my poor husband had to use like a pick to <laughs> slam into the ground. There were concrete pieces everywhere. Um, you know, he made all our raised beds. He made the arbor. He made this great... Um, uh, uh, cold frame for 10 bucks. We just, you know, again, you don't, we got donated materials and he bought a box of screws and built it. Right now I have arugula growing in the back. So again, we only have um, 0.17 acres and anybody can do this. If you have a sunny deck, you really can. 
So here, if anybody wants to get their phones out and um, take a picture. Uh, oh, and I didn't even, you know, I didn't get to talk about snails. Don't even get me started on the 83 rows of regenerative teeth that they have. I mean, uh, snails are amazing. Slugs are amazing. Um, I didn't show the Katie did or the praying mantis or, oh my God, the, the, um, the candy striped le the leaf hoppers. There was a lot I didn't get to show, but um, I, I hope, you know, you were able to learn a few things and, and gain some knowledge here. Um, I highly recommend all of these fantastic writers. And um, if you want to purchase plants, Dawn Foglia is a fantastic designer and has a beautiful nursery. Jesse is in Balsam Spa now. You got a bunch of questions. Oh, I do. Oh, okay. Last slide. Click on the chat. When you're okay. Just to answer the question. Sure thing. Um, so, um, worry about the environment. Don't worry about the neighbors. Plant it, and they will not only come; they will ceaselessly inspire and entertain for free. Anyone can do it. All you need is a plant and a dream. And um, I had already mentioned that wildlife gardening really gives you a new dimension. Um, it gives new meaning to beauty. So just knowing that you are creating a biodiverse habitat, um, it will make you sleep better at night. <laughs> so um, thank you very much again. Thank you, Wendy, for hosting. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm. I'm Really, I, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. And I apologize for taking a little too long. I get excited. I get on these tangents. And these are some really awesome. Look at the sweat bee. And look at this little wasp. This was in the garden last year. I planted this annual Salvia cocinea. Um, a little square headed waspy. Didn't bother me at all. Cute as a button. And this is another leaf cutter. This we will be selling as well. The Coreopsis lanceolata and the sneeze weed, we will be selling at the plant sale too. Um, Wendy, do you want me to, do you want to do questions or should, should I just like to totally finish and people who are not local, I mean, if anyone has to get off, I totally understand, you know, you probably need to eat dinner, get to your kids, whatever. Um, do you want me to run over the, the, this is information. If anybody wants to snap a picture of this as well, please do. Um, we're having our first pollinator palooza. Um, again, uh, members of our pollinator committee, um, big, big thanks to Christine Burghardt, the one I mentioned with the incredible garden who freaking dug her own pond and like made her garden mostly, you know, by herself uh, for free. Um, and uh, she has been working so hard at organizing and everyone has been helping to pot up and water and do things, but we're gonna have this fantastic native plant sale. We have hopefully, I and mean, we do have 1400 plants potted up and um, I'm going to now also show you um, what the plant list will be. If anyone wants to snap a picture of the plant list, this is what we would be selling on June 5th from 10 to three. It's only 10 miles from Saratoga, if anyone, um, remembers Oligny's, the garden center, Brian Oligny and his wife, I think her name's Debbie, the lovely couple, and they have, um, they're helping out Pitney, uh, but they've offered to let us use their greenhouse to grow our native plants and to use it for um, our Palooza. So we hope to see you there. Um, look at this beautiful graphic that Wendy and, um, um, Candace. Our, and Candace, yes, Candace created. So thank you, Candace. I don't know if she's on, but um, she's done a fabulous job. Oh, wait a second. One more thing. Ding, ding, ding. You too can own your own pollinator habitat sign for a mere $25. Uh, look at that. So our three key things, go pesticide free, plant native species, because you know everything will follow after that and life will begin to make sense. And mow less often. And um, you can get this, it's metal. It's got the two holes in it um, to put on a little stand wherever you'd like. Look at the beautiful graphic, kind of matches the one. And again, it's $25. We are not mailing them right now, but you can contact Wendy or Candace at Sustainable Saratoga. I delivered one to a friend in uh, Scholarville who is starting her uh, native garden as well. 
So um, I don't mind driving them around and dropping them off like, you know, in the nearby area. Um, I don't mind doing that at all. All right, should we go to those questions now? Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Joanna. Thank you. This has been fantastic. So some people may have to go, other folks yeah. stick around for questions. You can find anything about the native plant sale, our new um, initiative, No Mo May. Just head over to our website and you can find all the information on there or Facebook and Instagram. So for questions, let's see, there's a bunch of people that are loving your photos. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, the bat, the bat one was not mine. That's a stock photo. And then the other rose is hunters. But yeah, the rest are mine. And um, yeah. it's fun. That's another thing. Like you are going to you're just going to love it. Like, you know, and I, and I guarantee if anyone wants to come over, um, contact me if you want to come and see some wasps and you have children who are nervous as well, because once you get stung, you do, you have a bad association about it. Come on over. I'm always trying to have my friends bring their kids over as well. And we'll just hang out with the bees. We've got a question about dandelions. Um, okay. This person hears a lot about dandelions and letting them grow for the pollinators, and they just want to know whether they're native. Um, they're not native. Dandelions are not native, um, but they're more or less naturalized here. Um, I guess what? Let mine grow. Um, not only do the bunnies like them, but it's true that they are a uh, an initial food source for um, pollinators. And I, I just noticed this past weekend when it warmed up to about 70, they're starting to pop now. Um, it's funny because one of our um, neighbors in the neighborhood, not next door, um, um, our, our next door neighbors are awesome and would never, they, they love their dandelions too. But he was like, you're the one spreading dandelions because he was afraid that the dandelion seeds were, were going to fly into his yard. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Well, I, I was joking. Uh, I was like, you'll, you'll deal with it. But anyway, I found out a couple of years ago that now he thinks our garden is fabulous and he takes pictures of it and sends it to like his friends. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, and I, I did. I, so I've had, I've had some doubters and mm -hmm. that's okay. You know, I mean, I've been skeptical as well. Um, but you know, you don't know until you take that first step. Mm -hmm. And like I said, once you get on that learning treadmill, it's it's all uphill from there. Great. Okay, so a couple of people wanted uh, like the quote and stuff like that. We'll follow up and email you with you know copies of that and the resources and things like that. Somebody asked about the native uh, pollinator signs. Some of them were served. Oh yeah, and get one from us. Yep. Uh, lots of organizations that have them. Yes, uh, but this this is Xerxes Society. Highly recommend you become a member. Um, North American Butterfly Association, if you want to join them, you know, or anything on, on social media, ours is only $25 and ours is very well made as well. So you, it, we leave ours up in the winter time and they're fine. I left mine up last winter too, and it looks just the same as yeah. I put out. Looks great. Uh, here's a question about creeping thyme. What, they want to know if it is a good cover crop that is beneficial or native. <sighs> Dear, I think I got to get back to you on that one. I don't think it is. I mean, so herbs, I was also going to say, if you want to, like, I love herbs. Who doesn't love herbs? And a lot of herbs are, um, they're from the Mediterranean. They're from Europe, from Asia. You know, right now I'm growing a new herb, um, lavender oregano. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that sound great? It's growing beautifully. So um, the creeping thyme, I mean, I do have, I'm growing thyme as well. I, I, believe it's not oh creeping charlie yeah not native um i do in my okay this is what i do in my flower beds i pull out i have so many dandelions on the naturalized lawn i do pull out dandelions in some of my flower beds i do and i pull out creeping charlie in my beds because i don't want that to take over actually you know those beautiful little um um, oh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, that's right. I forgot to mention that. Um, I'm, I know I'm on the Seroptimus tour this year uh, as well. Christine was on it last year, and I'm on it um, this year. But I, uh, let's see, Creeping, there's one called Creeping Jenny I found out about last year, another new, like, not so nice, you know, uh, plant that I don't want growing. 
Um, that's growing now with the bishop's weed, the, the garlic mustard I'm pulling out. Some, you know, the dandelions now I'm trying to harvest because like I said, I'm, we're going to be eating the, um, the garlic mustard. I'm just going to braise it and eat it. It's totally edible. And before it starts flowering, it's not super bitter. It actually tastes, tastes good, tastes mild. Um, but the creeping Charlie, I pull out in my flower beds. Yeah. Okay. Oh, right. So um, no mo May. You know, I have like no, no Movember. Like guys don't shave their beards in November. Well, I am, uh, my husband and I are on board. We are not, we haven't, oh, there you go. Thanks, Wendy. <laughs> no May, yeah. So there's a sign out in front of the, uh, the, the uh, Unitarian Church as well. Um, I never mowed like last September or October. We have an electric mower. And now I think I'm just gonna, I was just, I was thinking of just mowing paths anyway, and then kind of dealing, building no new beds and throwing down some wildflower seed. Um, but yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting. I bet I find a lot more insects as well if I don't mow. It'll be great. Julie wanted to know about moss. She's got a lot taking over this year. Is that good or bad? Moss? moss. Oh, I love, oh, I love moss. Oh, I love mosses. I would love to have like, I call it our gracio because it was, you know, it's not a patio. We didn't put rocks down. So we call it the gracio and it's whatever pops up. It's thyme and mint and it's all different stuff. But I would, I, there's a, a actually a really cool um, horticulture, like landscaping movement to just have like moss patios, a mossio. So I, I think I find new mosses. Um, I found them uh, growing in one of my beds just the other day. And I looked it up. Um, if you use iNaturalist, there are a lot of awesome apps that you can just, you know, take a picture and, and it will help identify it for you. I use it all the time. Um, again, it's called iNaturalist or iNat for short. Um, and I found like a new moss and I was psyched. Yeah. All right. I think that's everybody's questions. If you have other questions that come to you later, you can email me, Wendy at sustainablesaratoga.org, and I will make sure to pass along questions to Joanna. Um, yeah, we'll try to follow up oh. with you. We can put the quote and stuff like right. that in the event comments and, and stuff like that on, on Facebook. And so, yeah, just reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you again so much, Joanna. Thank you, Wendy, for hosting and helping me through those stupid tech snafus. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope, uh, you know, go out and get a plant. Just start small. <laughs> and if anyone has questions, feel free to let Wendy know or, or me know. Um, I am on, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and oh, yes, Catherine just wrote Gathering Moss. Robin Wall Kimmer is a phenomenal Braiding Sweet Grass is the, her more right famous um, book, but uh, that thank you for for mentioning that I haven't read that one. Yeah, mm -hmm. and thank you again. Fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.